Um, now we're going to switch over to um, Don. And so I've been looking forward to this for quite a while. We have a wagon master here, is that right? Let's, let's, let's take a tour of the Oregon Trail. Okay, uh, given the time, think of this as kind of the Rocky Horror Picture Show of uh, educational technology presentations. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for being here for the, the last session. And uh, uh, it's typical uh, to start these, these talks by saying I'm, I'm really glad to be here. But in this case, since it's my first Dust or Magic conference, I really am glad to be here. And thanks to uh, Warren, where did he go, for, uh, for inviting me to come and tell my story. Uh, now, in case you, uh, you didn't read your uh, biographical section uh, in your program, a uh, little snapshot here. I've been in educational technology for 37 years. I've worked for the companies you see, a couple of small ones, a couple of uh, very large ones. Uh, typically uh, leading teams of people in the development of product, some work in teacher training, some work in helping schools and districts plan um, implementation. The thing is though, that when I was in college, I determined that I wanted to be a teacher. And so when you, when you think that that's what you want to do with your life, you tend to daydream a little bit and you say to yourself, someday I'm going to impact the lives of hundreds of school children. Now in my case, uh, fate took a hand. And uh, for various reasons, I didn't get the opportunity to be a teacher, which we can go into after the session over at the bar. But uh, on the other hand, 40 years ago, to the month, Unexpectedly, found myself uh, co-creating an educational simulation game that, that was ultimately going to give me the opportunity to influence and impact millions of school children. Uh, and so that's the story that I'm here to tell. Uh, I'd like to do a couple different things. I'm going to tell you how the Oregon Trail game got invented and the technology environment in which that happened. I'd like to talk about uh, the design of the game and give you some insights into what's under the hood. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, some ideas I have about the most effective way to use games like this in the classroom. And I hope at the very least I will give you some insight into how we thought about computers in schools and the design of software way back when. But I'm hoping to draw out some impl uh, implications from that that will be relevant to the work uh, that you do today. So, to begin the story, uh, we need to go back, back through the mists of time to the dawn of K-12 educational computing. Now, just prior to this time period, uh, computers had become uh, commonplace on college campuses. And the way that you interface with a computer was by gathering up the instructions you wanted to give the computer, punching it on a bunch of cards, putting the cards in the right order to form a deck, going to the computer room, which was hermetically sealed, handing your cards to a staff person who went in, fed it into the computer, they ran it, and then they came back to you with a printout. Now, how many people have done computing this way? Okay, um, a few. Okay, so you remember the good old days. And that worked at the college level because all the people that needed to use the computer were right near the computer. But for elementary and secondary schools, um, that was not going to do it because you're not going to put a computer in every school building. So um, at the time, computers, of course, were very large. We called them mainframes. They uh, took up rooms the size of this room and bigger. Uh, and um, generally, the rooms were uh, environmentally controlled, so you didn't go into them. But uh, technology marched on, and uh, eventually the technology was created that allowed you to uh, access a computer via a telephone line. And uh, when you did that, the interface was done not through punch cards anymore, thank goodness, but through um, a, a keyboard device, the teletype. They were big, they were noisy, um, but they were workhorses. And um, the, that was the way it worked. You would you could put a teletype in a classroom uh, next to a telephone. You could make a telephone connection to a computer anywhere. Your, your, your city, your state, another city, and uh, you could now begin to do computing um, in, in an elementary or secondary school. So um, this, this is how things got going. Into this environment, st 
step three young college students. Well, we were seniors, actually. Uh, Bill Heineman, Paul Dillenberger, and myself were students at Carleton College, uh, a liberal arts school in Minnesota. And we were starting our senior year in the fall of 1971, and we had to do our practice teaching, our student teaching. Uh, so we decided in, instead of doing that in the rural area where the college is located, we would do it in the schools of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Bill and Paul had taken some computer programming um, as part of their college work. I had no idea how a computer worked. Uh, we got an apartment in Minneapolis and every day we would come home um, and share with each other the trials and tribulations of learning to be a teacher. Uh, at the time, um, Bill and Paul, because they knew a little pro about programming, and because the Minneapolis schools was something of a pioneering district that had a computer that was solely devoted to instructional computing, not one that would fill this room, it was about the size of this table, but teletypes in schools, they could access the computer and do instructional things. So Bill and Paul began to um, use the computer to show their math kids something about programming, the logic of it, uh, formulas you might use, that they related to math. I was tasked with creating a unit on the westward movement in the United States, and I thought, because reading about that in a textbook was not going to be um, any, anything exciting, that I should try to do something innovative, and that would be to create a game. So I created a large game board, the western United States, I had a deck of cards, I was probably fooling around with dice, a kind of a Dungeons and Dragons approach. Uh, and that's when uh, we exchanged a couple of key questions. I asked them, if you're having so much fun with the computer and math, why can't we do something with it in social studies? And they asked me, what are you fooling around with a game board and dice and cards for? We could do that on the computer, couldn't we? So uh, we went to work and in about 10 days, we put together version 1.0 of the Oregon Trail. I provided the uh, historical information, they did the programming, the, the format of the game, and um, we uh, were ready to unveil it. So, on December 3rd, 1971, in a building since torn down, Jordan Junior High School was the first use of the Oregon Trail um, in, the, in classrooms, uh, in my eighth grade social studies classrooms. The kids took to it immediately, of course, most of them uh, had not um, had a lot of experience with the computer. You have one teletype in a school building, you don't get on it very often. But um, also, they weren't used to, to doing games in the classroom. So this, this was a, a great thing for them. This was a big deal. And uh, Bill and Paul, of course, couldn't resist introducing it to their math kids. And we noticed that kids didn't, were just not just interested in during class time, before school started, during lunch, after school, they were lining up outside our classrooms for a chance to sit at the teletype and play this game. So um, we knew that at that point, we must have something uh, that's worthwhile here. We did that for a couple of weeks, and uh, then it was time for uh, the term to be over and time for us to leave our student teaching programs. Uh, and so as guests on the Minneapolis school's computer, we had to remove everything that, uh, that we had put there. Uh, however, before we deleted the code of the Oregon Trail game version 1.0, we printed out a, a listing of the code on the teletype, which turned it into a roll of paper, the sacred scroll. Uh, and uh, we printed a couple of copies, and uh, that's the, the Oregon Trail existed as a non-digital entity for a couple of years. So. Just, just as a, a little sidelight now to this, the history of the game, um, this, this again was a time when schools were starting to use computers if they could buy one, um, a fairly large one, or if they were near a college or university that would get, give them access. And uh, there were several um, um, areas of emerging leadership in the country at the time. It wouldn't surprise you that the Bay Area and San Francisco would be such a place and perhaps that the Boston area, with all of its colleges and universities, would be such a place. But there was another place where, that was going to become a national leader in educational computing, a place that at the time people would not have readily guessed, and that is the great flyover state of Minnesota. 
Why in the world would this have happened in Minnesota? A couple of reasons. First of all, Minnesota, people probably don't remember, was the Silicon Valley of mainframe computing at the time that there were a number of large companies that manufactured these behemoth computers that were headquartered in the Twin Cities, or if not, they had large installations in the Twin Cities. So Minnesota had a computer literate populace to a greater degree than many other places. Number two, there was a tradition of progressive education in Minnesota. There was a lot of experimenting going on in the schools there at the time that had nothing to do with technology, new ways to teach, new curriculum, new ways to organize schools, and so forth. And then there was the legislature. Now we don't often use the term legislature and innovation in the same sentence, but in this case, the Minnesota legislature did something um, uh, that was, uh, I think in retrospect, fairly remarkable. Now, I, I come from Illinois, and we use legislature and corruption in the same sentence quite a bit, uh, but Minnesota was different. The legislators listened to their computer literate constituents, the voters, who were telling them, if we have computers in colleges now, just any day now, it's gonna, people are going to find a way to bring it down into the elementary, secondary level, like in places like e Minneapolis, for example. And the legislature said, if, if that happens, and every one of the 436 school districts in our state is allowed to make their own decisions about how to do computing, the result will be chaos, exactly. So um, now up in Minnesota, the, the good Scandinavian folks, they, they don't like chaos. No, not at all. So uh, they, they knew that everyone would have different hardware. Everyone would have different software that wouldn't run on each other's hardware. You couldn't train teachers in any kind of consistent way because it would depend on where they were located. And so they said, what we need is to bring order to this situation. And in 1973, they created, as a public entity, part of state government, the Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium, or MEC. Uh, and MEC was given two major tasks. Number one, lead the planning of how computers would be used in the state and set standards for how they would be used and what could be purchased. And number two, provide computing services to those that otherwise wouldn't have them. Because if you were right here on that star, Minneapolis, St. Paul, you were always within a local phone call of a computer. But if you were up in Thief River Falls or Lake Wobegon, uh, you, you would have to make, at best, a long distance call, which would be terribly cost prohibitive. So the, uh, the legislature said we're going to fund MEC to set up a, a mainframe system that's going to serve the entire state, uh, the schools of the entire state, and a telecommunications network that's going to send high speed lines out into the hinterlands um, to place, setting up hubs so that from any school district in the state, you can make a local call to get to the computer that's down in the Twin Cities. MEC was formed in 73, and began to offer these services in uh, July of 1974, and four months later, um, I stumbled in, um, having been hired at MEC. Were you hired because of creating Oregon Trail? Uh, no, they didn't know about Oregon Trail. Uh, and uh, I, well, I was hired um, because I had worked for somebody there before. Um, who, who knew I was an educator and could maybe be helpful? I, I was hired as an administrative assistant. I mean, I was the lowest guy there. All right, so I walked in. I saw they had this big mainframe system with a library of applications on it that had been collected over time, and I asked, do we need any more? And they said, well, sure, we could always use more educational programs. So I found the Sacred Scroll, and one weekend I sat down at a teletype, and by hand, I typed in the 800 lines of code that formed the Oregon Trail game. Uh, and we can show you those lines of code. Where's Warren? How do I flip to um, document cam? It's easy. <laughs> Uh, 
This, is, this happened a few years later, but the um, editor of Creative Computing, David All, asked if, uh, if he could print an article about the Oregon Trail, including the code. So, hmm. Open source. <laughs> open source it is. On the right, and for three more pages, uh, we have uh, the, uh, the code in small print, quite a bit of it. Now you might, you might ask yourself, well, what in the world? Why would you publish the code to this game where everyone can see it? Um, so we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. Uh, okay, so, uh, so this was put up and now suddenly the students and teachers of Minnesota had access to the Oregon Trail game. Okay, I need to go back. Uh, what do I want to do here? Thank you. What language? Computer language. It was in the basic computer language, as most stuff was, and basic is an acronym that stands for? Thank you, Mike. Beginner's All-Purpose Symbolic Instruction Code. There's a question. Better known as BASIC. Okay, another thing that occurred to me is that we had created the original version in uh, two, less than two weeks, so we had not had time to do the requisite historical research to back up the model. So about a year after I got to MEC, I did that, and I'll discuss that in a minute. And the... Um, uh, the other thing that I did was uh, we, we believed at MEC that teachers needed help in implementing programs in the computer's library. And I'm going to skip the cam here and just hold this up for a second. Sure. Okay. So this is the Oregon Trail teacher guide from the 70s, written by me. <laughs> and uh, a flimsy item it is. But this, uh, this had information in it for teachers, like the uh, learning objectives that the game uh, supported something about the content of the game, sample lesson plans, bibliographies and resources that the teacher could go to and so forth. And we, we believe that providing that kind of information to teachers was critical if uh, programs were going to get used and used appropriately in the classroom. Now time uh, continued to march on and toward the end of the 70s, the um, personal computer, or as we called them back then, microcomputers, emerged uh, on the marketplace. It became clear the schools were going to be very interested uh, in using these because they could give many more students access and the price per student would come down. And so uh, MEC began to turn its attention away from uh, mainframe computing and to the support of personal computers. Um, the first thing that we did was to take the best programs from the library and um, uh, convert them to the code for microcomputers beginning with the Apple II. So Oregon Trail became an Apple version. Um, one thing I, I forgot to mention uh, when, when it's on the timeshares, uh, uh, the mainframe system, uh, we used to go into the computer room at the end of the day and on the console you could bring up a report that showed all the programs in the library uh, sorted by their frequency of use. So you had a whole bunch of programs that were, had been used maybe 10 times that day, and a smaller group that had been used maybe 100 times. And then we kind of noticed every day at the top was Oregon Trail, which had been run several thousand times. Uh, so uh, again, a prime candidate for um, uh, conversion to microcomputers. Uh, here, here's a history of the various versions of the program, um, uh, things, things were added, uh, it was kept up to date with the technology. Probably the version that most people are familiar with, if you used it in school or you had kids that did, was the 1984 Apple II version <coughs> with the color screens and the, the scenes of the West and the, and the trail and the covered wagons and so forth. Uh, but there, there were many other versions, as you can see. Uh, Oregon Trail 2, which added a lot of multimedia content, was released in 95, and a year later, MEC was purchased by a software conglomerate that also picked up the learning company and some other of the uh, uh, top-notch uh, educational software developers. Uh, 
uh, Broderbund, and uh, they were going to create this massive uh, collection of the best software to make a gazillion dollars in the home market. Um, but it didn't quite work out. Um, and so through a series of mergers and acquisitions, the MEC assets, including Oregon Trail, have ended up with what is now called the learning company, not the original learning company, but, but they thought your name was the best, because yeah. no one knew what a MEC was. So, uh, uh, and in that time, versions have been produced for Facebook and, and iPhone. Um, uh, today, you can go to the Learning Company website. Um, uh, it's um, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, in parentheses. And uh, you can buy these versions, but you can also still get on CD um, one of the latter mech versions um, if you still want to buy a copy. Um, so that's what happened to the Oregon Trail program. So let's pause for a quiz. Oh, yes, Anne. Is it now sold in a version that will run on today's computers? Because my stuff is not. Well, um, I, I don't know that I know the answer. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so probably like the latest Macintosh, for example, could it could it run on that? And and, and you're saying you're saying no, and that's probably a good guess. There's an emulator. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, you can go online, if you Google Oregon Trail, uh, you can find um, an emulator site that will let you run the 84 version uh, in a simulated fashion. But it, I mean, it worked, it runs the same way that it was supposed to. Don, what's the code that's in their handout packet? Uh, the, there is not code in their handout packet. Uh, I'm going to get to the handout packet in a second. It's punch cards. Got it. <laughs> All right, pop quiz. How many copies of the Oregon Trail went out into schools and homes? Or maybe let's start with this. How many copies, where's Darren Carstens? Okay, how many copies of, uh, of a program, a, a CD that you might put out, uh, do you have to sell in order to consider it a hit program? I don't know. To, to be somewhat profitable. Oh, greater. Okay. Break even is forty thousand. Forty thousand. Okay. So just just for rounding off, let's say fifty thousand constitutes um, uh, better than break even. Okay. That that's a that would be a good good rule of thumb. So if Meg had distributed its software on CDs in colorful boxes on shelves, you we'd have a count of how many were sold. But the vast majority of Meg software was not distributed this way. It was distributed through a program which at the time was innovative and perhaps could be considered as the first site licensing program in educational software. It was called the membership program. So a school district or a collection of school districts could pay MEC a flat fee and have the rights for one year to make all the copies of MEC product that they wanted to. They were given a master copy of each program that, or each diskette of programs that was available then and they were given a legal copying utility disk. And they would gather up their Apple IIs in a room and get a bunch of kids who had nothing better to do on Saturday and they would pump copies. So now they could, they could have 20 Oregon trails in every elementary school so that the kids could all use it. So someone did the arithmetic based on the number of membership programs and the uh, combined enrollments and so on and it was determined that upwards of 65 million copies mm -hmm. of the Oregon Trail went out. Which is prompting you to ask, what in heaven's name are we doing in New Jersey for this conference when we could be on Don's private island hey. in the Caribbean? <laughs> because if Don and Paul and Bill each got, say, a buck, at least, for each of those copies, well, we'd all be wealthy guys. Leading to the bonus question, how much money did we earn? And the answer is? The break-even amount. Zero. <laughs> Zero dollars. Now, how could that be? Well, because at the time that we created version 1.0, there were no personal computers. Nobody had any idea what Jobs and Wozniak were going to do. Nobody realized there'd be a consumer-oriented software market. So the, the ethic of the day was, 
If you had something that ran on a mainframe, share it with as many people as you possibly could. Print it up in a magazine. So um, we, we take pride uh, as inventors in having created something that a lot of people wanted, but by the time um, it got on, uh, put on the mainframe system, and then the microcomputers came and the market started to develop, uh, it was Mech's property. And, uh... There. Oh. I, I earned one dollar from the Oregon Trail. Thank you, Mr. Bird. Right, don't worry about it. Okay, so, um... Yeah, so no private island. Uh, but, I guess what you could say is that um, I, I did, I and the others did receive a measure of fame from this, just not fortune. Now what? Darren wants his dollar back. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm back to breaking nothing right now. That was just... <laughs> now the fame has come in some rather interesting ways, um, and especially given that the game was originally invented in 1971, do the math, it's the 40th anniversary. By the way, December 3rd, 2011, big party at Warren's. We're going to celebrate the 40th anniversary. Uh, uh, maybe because it's the 40th anniversary, I, I have received a number of calls, done a number of interviews. I, I got four minutes on all things considered, you know, the pinnacle of cultural achievement in the U.S., so I'll go to the grave with that. Uh, I don't know if, if you're familiar with the website reddit.com. They have a feature called um, Ask Me Anything. So anybody can get on and type in. Um, I'm John Smith. Um, I'm an expert in um, uh, fish biology. Ask me anything about that. Uh, my 27-year-old um, son-in-law said one Saturday afternoon, we need to get you on that thing. So at noon, we typed it in. I'm Don Rawich, co-creator of the Oregon Trail game ask me anything. By the next morning when we woke up, there were a thousand posts on the, uh, uh, on the system, and um, I answered about 30 questions before uh, saying this is enough of that, but it was really interesting, the stories that people typed in and told, and the questions they asked, and of course, um, most gratifying and better than all the royalties that there could be, uh, their expressions of appreciation for helping them to waste so many hours of their youth playing the Oregon Trail. Of course, the Oregon Trail original version has contributed to the English language, and uh, I guess it's no secret what the most popular contribution is as immortalized on the t-shirt, you have died of dysentery. <laughs> the, uh, the marketers of the shirt uh, sent me one for, for free. <laughs> So even though I didn't become a wealthy man, I have achieved rock star status, which allows me to give speeches at conferences once. Okay. Where's that guitar? There we go. But we'll write the lyrics tonight. I'm going to take a break for a second, and uh, let's let's hear uh, if if it's possible three stories from the audience. Your first experience with the Oregon Trail, or something you learned from the, playing the Oregon Trail game, uh, either when you were very young or maybe helping your kids out. Anybody? Yeah. Here we go. Uh, I played it on an Apple II when I was a kid, and I learned what it meant to ford a river and how that's not always such a great idea. <laughs> okay, that's real learning. Anyone else? Here we go. Uh, I bought an iPad version of Oregon Train several days ago to prepare this meeting, and I found I can't kill my kids if I don't pay for money. So I spent a lot of work to save them and save to go to Oregon. <laughs> Did you make it? I'm still doing, but I have plenty of money, so I believe none of them will die. <laughs> it, uh, it, remind, it reminds me of the time 
that we got a letter at MEC from some kids at a school in Alaska who said, we know how to succeed on Oregon Trail every time. How is that? Well, at the beginning, the program asks you, um, how much do you want to spend on food? And let's say you say $100, so it subtracts $100 from your, um, uh, from your money supply, right? Well, what they would do is they would type in, we want to spend negative $10,000, <laughs> which would then subtract the negative 10,000, which would add 10,000. They had enough cash to do anything they wanted, and we, we um, noticed there was a little uh, uh, neglect in the code that had not trapped negative numbers, so okay. They all grew up to be bankers. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Okay, right. anybody else? One more? Our own Darren Carstens. <laughs> Over here, go. It's a little bit different now, but probably for the first 10 years of my career, whenever I tell anybody I did educational game design, the one most constant comment I'd get back would be, oh, you mean like Oregon Trail? It was the one frame of reference that everybody that had very little game or education experience could relate to. Um, just my best friend and I entered all 800 lines into a computer called a K-Pro 20 and then we spent all of our time trying to see how fast we could die of dysentery. <laughs> we thought that was, after we looked up dysentery in the dictionary, we thought that was the, the best part of the game. <laughs> well, at least you spent your youth wisely. Um, I have the copy of the Oregon Trail 2, and I think it was one of the first games where you became truly emotionally invested in the character, and when they died, you were actually upset by it, which kind of paved the way to become overly attached to my Sims characters. <laughs> okay, so we, we hope that didn't cause too much damage. But you, you live to, to live another day, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there have been many, many good stories. Uh, so let's, let's find out what's going on inside of the Oregon Trail program. Here's a simple diagram that uh, shows the, the general model. Now, I'm assuming that many of you have played at least once. So you know that um, your, the status of your success and probability of, of um, getting all the way to Oregon, 2,000 miles, rests in your resources. How much food you have, how, many, how much equipment and supplies and, and cash and so forth. So the first thing is that the program totals up your resources at the beginning of the turn. The game, of course, is played in turns. A turn represents about 200 miles or two weeks on the trail. It generally took the pioneers six months to get there, so a dozen turns uh, would, would typically be how long it, it takes if you make it successfully. Um, you're given some strategy choices. That may take you out of the loop and back, or more likely, uh, events happen to you, often misfortunes and sometimes you have to react and make decisions based on those um, <coughs> events and then you cycle back and go on to the whoop, go on to the next uh, the next turn where your resources are totaled up again underneath this simple version is this and i apologize for the the um, the ancient nature uh, of this this is um, from the teacher guide uh, and I, uh, you don't have to read the small print. Let's quickly go through it. You total up your resources. You make the uh, initial decisions, stop, continue, hunt. How well do you want to eat? And then things start to happen. Now you could loop out of this, and that would be the end, or you may be attacked by uh, riders who are intent on robbing you. Uh, you. You might, one way or the other, get into the misfortunes, and things could happen to you there depending on certain probabilities. You may uh, get uh, sick from illness. Halfway through the trail, you hit mountains, which brings, a, uh, brings around new misfortunes that can occur and certain weather conditions like blizzards that you didn't have to deal with before. And then ultimately, you come out of this somewhere and you loop back and start again. Where is dysentery? Well, let's see. Um, illness. illness, yeah. <laughs> there were different kinds of illness, I think. Uh, the, the point for me is this. I think this is the heart of the simulation. I think this is the key because this is a model where, first of all, there are many things that can happen. Second of all, um, they, 
they uh, don't always they don't always happen every turn they don't always happen in the same sequence and when one of them does happen the effect on your resources is always a little different uh, your wagon tips over in the stream uh, sometimes you lose twenty dollars worth of supplies sometimes it's twenty two sometimes it's seventeen and so forth which means that uh, and I never tried to calculate this, but the number of, of combinations of paths that are in here are, for all intents and purposes, limit, limitless. And therefore, the game never plays the same twice. And I think for kids, at least, uh, that's a real motivator. They want to get back. They want to solve the challenge. What was it like to travel the Oregon Trail on a teletype? Well, you, you had your teletype, and, and you had uh, attached to it a modem. Now today, modems are little circuit cards, right, about this big. Back then, they were devices called acoustic couplers, about as big as a shoebox. The coupler had two holes in the top, surrounded by a rubber seal in each case. You picked up the handset of the phone. How, anyone here who's never made a call on a phone with a handset? I know you're out there. <laughs> you picked up the handset, you dialed the number. We, at least we had push-button phones in 1971, or it wouldn't have worked. You, you heard a high-pitched tone in the uh, earpiece, and you took the handset and you plunked it down into the two holes in the coupler. And the rubber seals made sure that you had a tight um, connection, not bothered by ambient noise. A little light went on in the coupler, and the teletype sprang to life. Uh, welcome to the MEC uh, statewide system. Here's the day and the time. Please log in. Uh, so um, that's, that, that's how it was done. The output came out on a roll of paper, a roll of cheap paper, therefore it was yellow. The printhead moved at the astounding speed of 10 characters per second. You could type, it could type a 10 letter word in one second. Now at a time when uh, you press enter and our screens fill up with all sorts of text and all kinds of colorful images instantly. This, this probably seems um, pretty archaic. But um, here, here's a little, little point, a little PS off to the side. Uh, and, and this emphasizes, I think, something Warren said during the afternoon session. Uh, when the print head is moving at that speed and chunking along. I mean, you, you've seen in, uh, old movies of newsrooms where the hot story's coming in, it's chunking along. Your, the status of what happened to you is being revealed very slowly. Kids are glued to the paper, watching that printhead type out the message. Whereas if it had just all popped up at once, it wouldn't have been half as much fun. So advances in technology don't always equate to advances in the user experience. There was no screen, so there, there were no graphics. Uh, the only audiovisual uh, feature that you had on the teletype was a bell. You could put a, a character in the code, and uh, when the computer reached it, the bell would ring. So you just made it to Oregon. Congratulations. Ding, 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 ding. A uh, little anecdote, uh, at one point, the vendor that Mac used was revising the programming language, and they, for some reason, decided not to include the bell symbol. So some people on the Mac staff uh, got a trophy and awarded to this company the Nobel Prize. <laughs> Thank you. All right, how did you hunt on the teletype? You didn't have a little guy with a rifle. You couldn't aim somebody. You couldn't move them around. How did you do it? Uh, my, my two colleagues, Bill and Paul, they get all the credit for this. They devised a, uh, a little mechanism where when it was time to use your rifle, the computer would print out type bang or pow or blam. You never knew what the word was going to be, some gun noise word. And what you had to do was type that word as quickly as you could and hit the return key. Now the computer had a way to time the number of seconds from when it had completed type, typing out or printing out type bang and when you hit the return key from the word you typed in. So it would know how fast you typed it in. And the faster you typed it in, the better the success you had. There was a, there was a formula in there that said if you you type it in quickly, you're going to um, get more buffalo meat than, than if you type slowly. If you make a typo typing it in, 
you get nada. Okay, no, no success at using the rifle. So it was fascinating to watch kids who were torn between the desire to type as quickly as they could, but to type as carefully as they could. Um, and uh, that's, that's how you used a rifle. Um, on the teletype, or said another way, um, this is how to make do with the technology you have um, using some design technique that, that may not be optimal, but is workable. Inside your booklet, just after the biographical section, um, you'll see a sample run of a, uh, uh, a, a game of Oregon Trail from the mainframe version, version 1.0. It's four pages long. It shows you what would have come out on the teletypes roll of paper. It's annotated, so you can kind of follow along what's going on. And um, I'll, I'll leave you to look at that um, on your own, not take up more time right now. But you'll see that the things I've described um, are, are what happens as this, uh, as this unba uh, unveils itself. So that was, uh, that was computing technology, 1971. Now I mentioned that, uh, that I felt it was important to get the history right. So uh, this is what I did. First of all, I got some good maps, and I made sure that the mileage for each of the um, uh, famous landmarks, like uh, Chimney Rock, uh, Independence Rock, uh, Fort Hall, and so forth, uh, were positioned where they should be, so the computer could accurately tell you when you had reached them. I found uh, some tables uh, that trace back the price of various commodities all the way back into the 19th century, so uh, when you get on the Oregon Trail version 1.0 uh, and you're told you're going to pay $200 for an oxen, well, that's roughly what an oxen would have cost back then and the food and so forth. How, how were we to know how to set the probabilities that those events would occur? How often does it rain? How often do you die of dysentery? <laughs> how often is there a snake bite? How often does uh, somebody get sick? So I went in and found reprints of actual diaries, of the text of actual diaries from people who had traveled the trail. Amazingly enough, some of those have lasted all, all this long and been preserved. Uh, and I, um, I, I kept count, I kept score. So every day, what happened? So at the end, I had a bunch of data and it, I could average out, okay? Um, these diaries covered 130 days or you know, whatever it was, and this percentage of the days there was bad weather. Uh, I took those um, probabilities, I went back into the code, and I fixed the code so that those probabilities were reflected. So that, uh, at least roughly, we're, we're close to the historical record as to when things happen. Native Americans. Now, if you watch, watch enough old Hollywood movies, you know that the role of the Native American was to attack every wagon train that came through and shoot flaming arrows into them. However, that's not what uh, his historical research tells us. Uh, research tells us that Native Americans were all often helpful to the pioneers. They helped them know the trail. They helped them know when, where to cross and ford the river. Uh, was this plant uh, poisonous or can you eat it for, for nutrition? Um, those are things the pioneers didn't know anything about. Now, it's true that the wagon trains were attacked, typically by white guys who were out to steal your supplies and the valuable things you brought from home uh, to go to your new life. So those things are reflected, and there's a language in the program to suggest um, an, un, um, uh, what I, an inaccurate role that Native Americans played. <coughs> Now, I can tell you that each of those events had a certain probability, but how do they all add up together? What's the end result of playing the game? I don't have specific research on that, but my observation was when we did teaching uh, workshops and we sat teachers down at the um, teletypes and asked them to play the Oregon Trail for the first time, about half of them died along the way. History tells us that uh, the early wagon trains, the first people to make the trail in the early 1840s, when they went, their mortality rate was around half. So, um, not that I can claim this was part of the design, but fortunately it turns out that 
there is some um, realism uh, in how the game actually ends up for people. And, as you know, the more that you play a game, the better at it you get. Well, the more that the settlers traveled the trail, those that made it to Oregon wrote back to their relatives on the East Coast and the Midwest and said, you got to come out here, it's the land of opportunity, and if you come, here's what you need to do. Here's the clothing to bring and how much money and what to do with your food and so forth. So the idea that um, you get better as you play it is reflecting what happened historically. Uh, as a matter of fact, some of the enterprising pioneers sent material back that uh, a publisher would publish, and you could earn you know, a dime uh, on a guide sold in Philadelphia for how to travel the Oregon Trail. What did you learn? So let's talk about, I mean, that's the whole purpose of all this. We want kids to learn something. What did they learn about surviving the journey? Um, well, in, in, instead of me quizzing you, I'll just put up my cheat sheet. They learned about uh, the calendar and how the weather is attached to it and how that affects when you wanted to travel, where the trail was easy and tough, how to cross rivers, etc., etc. Now, to me, this is kind of the lower level of learning. This is the, these are the facts, the historical facts, so to speak, uh, associated with this period of history. But a, uh, a strong application, especially a simulation of real events, I think is, is always best when it covers um, multiple levels of learning. So what do you learn from the Oregon Trail that you might find in uh, the Common Core Standards, for example? Well, you learn something about history. You learn something about geography of the Western US. You learn about economics. I mean, what is it after all? It's scarce resources that you don't want to run out of on your way to reaching an objective. You learn something about the math, the mileage, the budgeting, and so on. So um, uh, this would be kind of the next level up for me. But on top of that, there's, a, there's some conceptual learning that goes on with a game like this that, that I always found interesting watching kids play it. Uh, the first thing is that when kids start out, well, first of all, you, you never have 30 computers, so you typically have kids run the Oregon Trail in small groups, pretend you're a, a family in a wagon. You've got five kids around the computer. It's time to start, and the computer asks you to make decisions. How much do you want to spend on this, spend on that? Well, imagine, um, imagine five ten-year-olds around a computer. They're all shouting out, how about this, how about this, I want this, I want this. And they quickly realize that the period on the clock is going to run out. They're not going to get to travel the Oregon Trail if they don't stop arguing with each other. And then it dawns on them. We have a way to deal with making a decision when everyone has different opinions. It's called voting. So I would watch them. Hey, whoa, we're going to start voting on these things. And they would take votes and majority rules. And that's how they would make their decisions. They, on their own, invented the democratic decision-making process so to speak. Uh, another problem, it's time to use the rifle. And, um, okay, type bang, all the hands fly to the terminal. Because we've got to get this typed in, we've got to get it typed in, and of course, the result would typically be, uh, we typed in too many letters and we didn't get anything. So uh, then it dawned on them, well, uh, Sally here is the best typist. She needs to sit at the, at, the, at the teletype keyboard, and everybody else needs to clear out when it's time to use the gun. And while we're at it, this is the person who's going to lead the voting. This is the person who's going to track us on a map. This is the person that's going to keep track of our resources so we don't run out and so forth. They discovered on their own what Henry Ford discovered, that if you use division of labor, you can be much more efficient in getting the job done. So. Um, just kind of a, a word to developers. If you think about the learning that, that you plan for in the game and realize that it could take place on multiple levels, I think you'll have uh, the, the strongest product that you can make. Let's just take one minute about instructional planning. So how, how do you use games like the Oregon Trail in the classroom? I try to think of a lesson or a unit of lessons as an arc that starts out with um, the leading. You gotta hook them. Okay, you can't just say to kids, hey, we're gonna start studying uh, the Westward Movement and think that they're gonna be excited. So I mean, we, we all know this. So you, you try to start out a unit with something that 
causes them to start developing questions in their mind that they're dying to know the answer to. And, uh, and that they, you're, you're telling them about things that are going to pique their interest. That's the lead-in. Then you deliver the direct instruction, what I call it up here, the core, the historical information, and, and so forth. And then we'd like to see if they can take all the pieces they've been given and apply it to a new situation, or maybe uh, be assessed on what they've learned, the application. So which one of these is the best place for the Oregon Trail? Opinions are welcome. <laughs> lead in. Where would you use it? Lead in? Who said lead in? Okay, what, what, what do you mean by that? I mean, well, what, what, you got to get them in the first few seconds or else you've lost them forever. You got to get them okay. in and keep them in. And if you put them on the Oregon Trail game right away and half of them die, the, the questions are, you know, Dozens of questions come up. What, what should I have done? What were we supposed to do here? So now I'm all, it's, it's, I'm all teed up for the core, the core instruction. So everybody agree, lead in? Yeah, no. Okay. You could use it for application because you could have learned all the kind of core things and then they could, I mean, I think somebody said everything, but you could absolutely have learned all the core stuff and then be applying your learning through your, through best going through the Oregon Trail. How about the Oregon Trail is your test? Mm -hmm. You've learned all about this stuff, and now you want an A? You gotta make it alive. I, I mean, I, you probably wouldn't say that as a teacher, but yeah, <laughs> I, I, I like it, okay? The Oregon Trail is the application. You, the lead-in was a, a movie, a short story about the, the settlers or whatever. And as a matter of fact, because of the stuff from the previous couple slides, you could use it as the core, too. So um, if you're designing a game, a simulation, and you can make it such that it would apply to any one of these three stages, uh, much more flexibility for the teacher. Um, the other concept that I think is important is extension, that it's not just about playing the game and see if I get to Oregon. It's what can we use, we use Oregon Trail as a launching point for other discussions. Uh, or activities, so I can have the kids write diaries of the trip they took on the computer, or make one of those guidebooks that we can sell to somebody. Uh, we can talk about other frontiers. What, the guys that sailed in Columbus's ship, what, what were they thinking? What did they face? How was their experience common with these settlers? The astronauts blast off in a rocket. Same thing, where, where are the connections? What's the same, what's different? Other people have emigrated, seeking a new home. Um, uh, the Afro-American immigration from the South between the World Wars. Uh, people wanted to live in cities and get industrial jobs, not be farmers. How do those things go together? And of course, students have their own challenges. How many students have had to move in their lifetime from one home to another, one state to another? Uh, how many have had to face the unknown? I mean, it kind of goes on and on. So, uh, in, in the design, think about how you can extend the use of the game to other things. So why is the Oregon Trail so popular? Why has it endured for 40 years? Uh, any thoughts? Yes, sir? Because you can die. Because you can die. And what, what do you mean by that? There's not a lot of software that gives you a counter where you die. Okay, so hmm. the stakes are high. And uh, maybe that adds to your motivation. Okay. I like that. There's a brutality about it. It's brutal. Okay, it's brutal. It's, it, it's real, it's gritty. Okay. That's a good one, yeah. Unvarnished. It's unvarnished. Uh, say, say another sentence. <laughs> I mean, I think I know what you mean, but... Yeah, it's, it, it doesn't sugarcoat, it just, it's kind of, it makes you kind of feel that it's real. Because it feels, it just has a, it has a real feel to it. You can almost smell the oxygen. In your mind. Theater of the mind. It, it leaves a lot to your imagination because you're reading it and sort of, it doesn't push at you, so you kind of create your own. 
Right, if we said, we, okay, uh, students, we're gonna study the frontier now, and so pretend that you're on the planet Mars, and uh, you have a space expedition, and you're gonna cross between this part of Mars to the next. Well, it's, so now it's kind of a fantasy. But the fact that this, this happened to real people, and, and you don't have to just take the Oregon Trail word for it, read the um, Little House on the Prairie books, or you know, whatever uh, other literature, okay? Uh, okay, so it, the fact that it, it, you can show a documentation that it's based on research and, and factual yeah, stuff that, that, is... That they actually have to teach about Okay, that. it's in the curriculum, all right? The people makes a difference. The child, the student makes a difference. The student makes it happen. Okay, all right, the, the student's kind of in the driver's seat, mm -hmm. we might say. Uh, I'm going to go over here. I was going to say, Agency. it was created for a genuine reason. Um, you're talking about the profit thing. I wonder if you guys are trying to make a profit and we're creating the same thing. And so you create something from the genuine idea that I want to teach and make life, the world a better place. And I think products like that will, will endure. Okay, um, and, and thank you, because I think that's where we were at the time. Uh, here's a, um, uh, a list of my reasons, uh, some of which are reflected in what you said. So it is a challenge. Um, I, uh, once again, it's a complex model, but very easy for the user. So all of the complexity is, is kind of hidden. Uh, reasoning, decision making, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and of course, it was um, kind of a unique application at the time. So, you know, the first one is always the one you remember. Uh, but what we provided here was a student-controlled simulated environment. And, uh, and I think that's, it, at the time we weren't even using those words, right? But, but uh, in retrospect, uh, I think we, we feel good about having created something like that. All right, so what, how, how does this apply to uh, product development today? Now, I realize that there are games that are not simulations, um, like tic-tac-toe, but that's trivial, but you understand. And there are simulations that are not games, like dissect a frog on the computer. Well, the frog loses, but okay, it, it, it's not a game. So my advice is coming from you know, my, my perspective from this experience. But um, I think that what you need to do is to strike a balance between three things. The content, which must be interesting, include human stories, and uh, actually somebody said it better this afternoon, include characters that will be memorable. Uh, it's gotta be appealing to the sight and sound and we're on the verge of touch. Uh, make it unpredictable, provide surprises. That's important. Uh, the logic, you have to solve a problem, you have to meet a challenge, you have to use your mental capabilities, and perhaps there is an arcade component that's important in a game for kids, um, like uh, the, the shooting of the rifle by typing in or aiming something and, and so on, uh, that, that might be a part of it as well. Now when I say strike a balance, well what, what do I mean? These are all equal in importance, um, you know, I don't really know, but I'm going to suggest this, uh, that content and logic are probably uh, of equal strength and the arcade part perhaps um, uh, a little less important, but still adds something to, uh, to the enjoyment of the game. Uh, um, I, all I'm suggesting here is if you're working on a game or a simulation, uh, just, just test the model against what you're doing and tell me over the two days how did you come out? What was your balance? Did it, is it really a square or a pentagon? You know, there's more than three things. What's the balance? Uh, I'd, I'd be quite interested to know uh, what you think. Technology has marched on again and again. So what about new Oregon trails? Um, what, what could we do with the technology that we have now that we didn't have in the 70s, 80s, and 90s? 
Here's um, two quick ideas. One thing about playing the Oregon Trail in its current form is that you're typically sitting alone at a computer. Maybe not in the classroom where a small group might be better, but at home, you're probably alone. Uh, so what about a, a real-time community version of Oregon Trail where, where you, uh, I don't even know how it would work. There's a hundred, we'll take the next hundred people that come to the website, we're going to put you in a wagon train, and you're all going to be able to talk to each other, and the decisions you make are going to affect what happens to the other people as well. What, what, what would happen? Okay, so who, who, who wants to? Who's got funding for that? Okay. <laughs> the other thing about the, the, the current version, or, or all the versions, is that you're, you're missing um, what may be an important feature of the simulation, which is uh, the, the traveling of a distance physically. You know, they didn't travel the trail sitting in an armchair. So what if, uh, what if we set it up that we're going to play the Oregon Trail out in the schoolyard, and that the teacher who's got an iPad with GPS capability is going to mark out some spots along the, the trail. Uh, and then you carry your iPad as you do this. And when you get to that spot, GPS wise, uh, the, the, um, the cloud knows what to tell you is going on. All right, so you could actually have the kids you know, marching along and get the sense of, wow, we started way back there and we only have this far to go, but we're about to die. Maybe that would be an improvement. Um, if you come up with better improvements, uh, you know, t uh, take it and run with it. Okay, well, uh, just before I wrap this up, um, thanks so much for, uh, for sticking with it. I appreciate that. Um, I, what a long, strange trip it's been um, in a covered wagon. We talked about what kids learn from the Oregon Trail. Well, what did I learn from the Oregon Trail? Lessons for life. Number one. Plan ahead, the journey is, no, there's danger out there. Be patient, the journey is long. Lesson number three, if you persevere, you'll find your green valley. And lesson number four, even if the water's deep, sometimes you just have to cock your wagon and head out from shore. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you.